Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. Welcome. Those of you who are watching online, it is great to be with you. Those of you at our Brockport campus, welcome. It's good to be together, good to be in the house of the Lord. And just want to let you know a few things before we begin our worship. And I hope that you're coming expecting today to hear from God. And uh, we're going to begin that worship in just a minute. Just want to share with you a few things. First of all, love to connect with you, especially if you're new. And those of you online, there's a link. You can click that and fill that link out, and we will get back to you. But those of you at our Greece campus, Brockport campus, there's a card in the pew. Please fill that out. Take it to the welcome desk, and we have a gift for you. Again, would love to connect with you. Just want to let you know that uh, next week is an um, opportunity to meet the pastor immediately following this service. So if you have any questions about the church or mission or values, love to talk with you. It's in room 19 and 20, which is just off the worship center here. So I want to encourage you to take advantage of that. Also, after the service day, the fourth weekend of every month, uh, we have private communion available for anybody who would like to take advantage of that. Immediately following the service, just kind of organic. You can just go over there and, and uh, you can sit in the pew and, and uh, read scripture while you're waiting for others to commune. Um, but again, if you would like that, that's going to be available immediately following uh, the service today. And then also, a couple opportunities for growth. First of all, Financial Peace University, we're offering starting this Tuesday strongly encourage you to go through it. It was life-changing for my wife and I when years ago we went through it and uh, really taught us how to relate to money. And I use that word purposely because we do relate to money. But it also really helped our relationship as well. And uh, great ways to how to save money and especially in the economy today. Just encourage you, Financial Peace University, you can sign up through the app, through our website. It's not too late. It begins this Tuesday. Again, life transforming. Other opportunity as well, which is so important. It's called Activating God Space. Our Dave Harrell uh, teaches this seminar, and it is fantastic to equip you in how to share your faith. And that's going to be taking place on Saturday, March 11th at our Brockport campus, and also Saturday, March 18th here at our Greece campus. You can sign up through the app, through the website, and go to the welcome desk if you want. Great, great opportunity. A few hours, and you will be equipped, and you'll feel much more comfortable uh, sharing your faith. And then finally, uh, our voters' assembly is finally here. That's going to be taking place after the late service at 12:30, right here at our Greece campus. And that is when we have been um, praying and praying and praying for this vote to call a seminary. And uh, so we're just asking the congregation to give us approval to go ahead and do that. That's going to be taking place here at 12:30. So if you have some time, uh, come back for that. It's not going to be a real long uh, meeting. But it's really, really important meeting because we are praying that God would lead to us uh, the next right um, person to help us in ministry and to shepherd this congregation. So continue to pray that process up. So with those thoughts in mind, uh, why don't we stand and get our hearts ready uh, for worship? Good morning, everybody. Grace and peace to you. Um, some words from Psalm 27 this morning. If you want to close your eyes and just let these wash over you, I'm going to read them and then I'm going to pray for you. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? One thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. O oh, great God of heaven, we bow our hearts to you today, and we bring our whole selves, all that we've dragged in with us, all the hidden spaces of our heart, and we just ask that you would do your great work in us. We bow to you, and we know that you are in charge. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's worship.
restored. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. You will do great things. Chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God. Sing hallelujah. You free every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive, oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Oh hero of heaven, you conquer the grave, you free every captive. Oh 
Would you open our eyes to gaze upon your goodness, which is your glory. Father, would you meet us here in the, in the worship of your people? Would you draw us in with your kindness and your mercy like you always do? By your power of your Holy Spirit, meet us here. In Jesus' name we pray. Before you sit down this morning, would you greet those around you this morning? Make them feel welcome. Well, we're starting a new series called Be a Light. It's all about light. Because light is a major theme all throughout the scripture. Everything began in darkness. And there was a moment when God said, let there be light. In the Hebrew, it's just two words. Light be. And it was. In that moment, all of a sudden, there was uh, electromagnetic radiation with varying wavelengths traveling 186,282 miles per second. Potential energy and kinetic energy deposited around the universe to fuel its existence for who knows how long. Let there be radio waves and microwaves and gamma rays and x-rays and infrared and ultraviolet rays. Let there be light. Light, it's the source of so much. It's, it's the source of vision. Without it, we can't see a thing. Light is the key to technology. It's how we can talk to somebody halfway around the world without hardly a delay because light can circle the world seven and a half times a second. Light is the first link in the food chain. Without it, there is no photosynthesis. No photosynthesis, no food. Light is the basis for life and health and hope. Let there be light. But it didn't end in Genesis chapter 1. It's a theme all throughout the scriptures. Even though darkness continually tried to overcome the earth and keep the earth in shadow, the light of God would break through and it would come. He would lead his people out of bondage and slavery in Egypt through the wilderness to the promised land by guiding them by a pillar of fire at night. Aaron, the first priest, would speak a blessing of God upon the people that we still use today in the church today. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. Because the light of God's presence was a blessing to his people. King David said, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light on my path. The word of God is the light of God. The same powerful word that was there at creation that said, let there be, is the same powerful word in the scriptures. The exact same. When God said, let there be at creation. When you study the creation account, you see God's word went forth. That, that's actually the second person in the Trinity, Jesus. The word, he was part of the creative process. And then Jesus, the word, came to this earth in the flesh. And by his spirit, he wrote down his words for us. Do you realize this is not just a book? This is the voice of God. And it should bring light into every area of our life. Uh, certainly our salvation, but also into your workplace, into your business, your thinking, your school, your relationships, your dating, your marriage, your purpose, your family, all of these areas. How does light come? It comes from the voice of God, the very word of God. And when you open up the voice of God, when you open up the word of God, the same power that was there at creation that brought light and life is the same power that brings light and life to your life. There was a very dark time in the history of God's people, in the history of the world, where, really, where darkness was engulfing the world because of oppressive rulers. And God raised up a prophet who said, the people walking in darkness will see a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, in the shadow of death, a light will dawn. And 800 years would pass. 
And it seemed like the darkness was just growing and growing and overcoming. Warring armies of ever-increasing wickedness, demonstrating man's inhumanity to man. The Assyrians and then the Babylonians and the Persians, the Greeks and the Romans, perfecting more and better ways to kill each other and to oppress one another. Would Isaiah's prophecy ever come true? And then there was one young couple in a little town of Nazareth who heard that they were to travel under the shadow of an occupying brute force of the Roman Empire to a little place under the rule of an egotistical maniac named Herod to a little town of Bethlehem. And a light in the sky shone in the dark night and it led wise men from the east to come and to worship this newborn baby, Jesus. The light had come into the world. And God wrapped himself in the skin of his own creation, subjecting himself to the care of his own creation, depositing himself as a helpless baby into the depths of human darkness. And Jesus grew up and he walked as an itinerant teacher. And the signs and the wonders that he did were just amazing. He gave sight to the blind, the lame walk. He raised the dead to give a peek into the kingdom that he would one day bring. But he made equally amazing statements, declaring who he was. I want to just talk about one of those statements. And I want to give you a little context of it, okay? Because one day he stood after what was called the Feast of the Tabernacles in the temple. The Feast of the Tabernacles was a number of days celebration where thousands of people would descend upon Jerusalem into the temple to celebrate what God had done years ago in the wilderness, uh, bringing them into the promised land. And during this feast, what they would do is they would light hu four huge candelabras in the biggest courtyard of the temple. And when I say huge, they were 75 feet tall. Just so you know, the peak of the ceiling is a little over 30 feet. 75 feet. There were four of these candelabras. And they would light them every night of the feast. On the last night, they would make uh, the flame even bigger. And uh, William Barclay said this, the candelabras set such a blaze of light throughout Jerusalem that every courtyard was lit up with their brilliance all night long. But then the feast ended. And the next morning, when the light was extinguished, everybody had to go back live under the oppressive rule of the Romans and of Herod. And it is on that day that Jesus walked into that same courtyard where those candelabras were. And this is what he proclaimed. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I am the thread from the beginning of creation. I am the light that connects with people walking in darkness. I am the one who will give you the vision of who God really is. I am the one who can give everlasting life. I am the one who can give unending hope. And unfortunately, most people did not listen to him. And they did not receive him. And they hated him and they nailed him to a cross. So that darkness could try and continue to cover the earth. And they buried him in a dark tomb. But on the third day, he rose again as the light and life of the world. And, that, and he showed the world that the darkness, not even the darkness of death, could hold him, could overcome him, could stop him. And he wanted everybody to know, people, you no longer have to die in the darkness of your sin. I have paid the price. You do not have to be empty anymore because I am the light of life and I can fill you with life. You do not have to be hopeless anymore because I have overcome any darkness that you will face, even the darkness of death. You don't have to be lonely for I am with you and I am a light that can never be extinguished. And then Jesus did an amazing thing. He did a little shift and he looked to his followers and he said something amazing. He said, now I am going to give you my light, my life. I'm going to dwell in you. Now I'm going to use you 
to share my light with the world and to push back the darkness. And can you think of any more noble, higher calling than these words of Jesus to you? Here it is. You are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. The world needs the light of Christ to shine through his people brighter and brighter. I mean, you want to see darkness? Just look at our world. Follow the cable news channels. Look at the politics. Look at pornography that is just destroying a whole generation. Look at social media. Look at Russia and Ukraine. There's darkness everywhere. People have personal darkness. There's economic darkness around the world. There's the darkness of famine and disease and war. And of course, there is spiritual darkness everywhere, a growing epidemic of hopelessness. And Jesus says to us, he has to tell us, you are the light of the world. Not I hope you will be, not you might be, you are the light of the world. People of hope, you are the light to Monroe County. You are the light in Greece and Hilton and Spencerport and Brockport and Arondacoit and Henrietta and Webster and Penfield. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill can't be hidden. I don't know if you've ever experienced this where you have been out on a body of water uh, and dusk is, is falling. And when you look back to the shoreline, uh, before the night falls, it's actually hard to see the city and the towns and the homes. But when the sun finally goes down and the darkness of the night comes, all of a sudden you can see the lights on the shorelines, right? You can see the cities and the towns and the homes. See, when the sun goes down and the skies go dark, that's when the church shines. Jesus said, let your light shine. He didn't say, I, I need you to be perfect. He didn't say, I need you to have all the answers. He said, let your light shine. I just want you to be a light. So how can we be a light? There's all kinds of ways, lots of examples from Scripture. I'm just going to share with you one. It's one of the first disciples, a guy by the name of Levi. Uh, we may know him as Matthew, the tax collector. This is what it says. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed Jesus. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, who belonged to their sect, complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor but the sick. Now Matthew, being a tax collector, would have had a very lucrative business, but he was an outcast in his town because he was working for the oppressive Roman government and his neighbors would have hated him and they would have despised him. And he had everything that money could buy, but there was something missing because this itinerant rabbi comes along and he says, Matthew, I choose you. Follow me. And Matthew was overwhelmed by Jesus' acceptance and his love. And he left everything to follow Jesus. That meant walking away from a lot of money. That meant walking away from power. But he would not walk away from his friends who were lost like he used to be. What could he do to reach them? I mean, these are his buddies. These were friends who worked beside him in the cubicle at work every day, counting the money. These are his friends that he'd go out to the bars after work with. These are the guys that he would do March Madness brackets with. And he wanted to see them in heaven, to know Jesus. So how could he be a light to his friends? 
And I just imagine thinking, I know, I'm going to throw a party. I like parties. My friends like parties. I like food. They like good food. And I'm going to invite Jesus and some of his disciples. And I'm going to invite some of my tax-collecting friends. And I'm going to just let them mingle and get to know each other and realize there's a whole lot that they actually have in common. And maybe, maybe by God's grace, a spiritual flame will be lit and get ignited. And maybe by God's grace, some of them will even trust in Jesus and follow him also. I mean, Matthew must have checked it out with Jesus because Jesus came to the party and he had no problem with it. And I just imagine Matthew praying as that party was about to begin, God, if only my friends could experience what I've experienced. If only they could know you the way I now know you. If only they could see Jesus the way I see him. Oh, God, could you change their hearts? Could you change their lives like you changed mine? Please, God, would you stir something in their heart? And I just want to ask you, who are people in your life right now that you are praying for, that God would stir in their heart, that they would come to know Jesus as their Savior? You know, last year we talked about identifying four people in your life. And four is not any magic number. It can be less. It can be more. We just talked about four people that you could identify and begin to intercede for and to pray for. It could be somebody that you know in your family, a family member who has drifted, and you're not even sure if they're walking with the Lord anymore. It could be a coworker, maybe even somebody you don't even care too much for, but God has placed you there for a reason. Maybe it's somebody who's going through a crisis, who's sick or ill. Who are people that you could pray for? Would you intercede on their behalf? Would you include them with some of your activities, some of your meals, and then invite them to worship where they will hear the good news of Jesus Christ, or better yet, share the good news with them? Would you be willing to give up a few hours on a Saturday so that some of your fears can dissipate and you can be better equipped and just more comfortable talking about your faith. A little while later, I'm going to talk about some light bulbs that we have out in the foyer at both of our campuses. And I'm going to ask you to think about names that you can write on the light bulb that you will pray for those people over this year. And then we're going to put those light bulbs into a light board Here at the Greece campus, it's right across from the cafe, Brockport campus, it's out in the lobby. Those of you who are online, just give us the names of people. Our host will take those names and write them on the light bulb for you. And it's going to light up the word hope. Now, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later. But first, I want you to hear from a friend, uh, Kirsten. I'd like to invite her up because Kirsten's been a great encouragement to my wife and to myself in a lot of different ways, but especially um, her uh, passion for the gospel and We have been uh, praying for a long time for her mom um, to come to faith, and I just asked her if she could just share uh, that testimony about how the Lord brought her mom uh, to faith. And and so, um, you know, as we prayed um, months ago, you've been sharing the gospel for many years and praying for your your mom, and she was a little resistant, to say the least, right, over the years. So tell us about that journey. So, um, good morning. I shared this. Testimony with Pastor Kirk in real time back in May, and when he asked me to share it, I was thrilled. And his email first said like three to four minutes, and then the next time he talked to me, he said like five minutes. So I figure that's six to twenty minutes. So we'll see you around noon, you know. <laughs> but I have to give you a little history. My mother was eighty-three, so you can't really tell it in a sentence or two. But my mother was born in Germany in nineteen thirty-eight during World War II, and um, she, her only really um, hint into religion was with her grandparents when she would go into the country and they would send her off to church. But normally in her city, the church was meant for baptisms or funerals or weddings. So she really didn't have any idea of of what a church service was. But when she came to the United States and met my father, she found St. Luke's um, Lutheran Church here in Rochester and she thought it was important for us to go. So my brother went through confirmation. I was six years younger um, and Pretty much around that time, I was introduced to a neighbor who invited me to another church that had some kids' programs, and so I started attending there, and and our family church life kind of died, but um, that church um, where I started going, um, and I'm just going to put a plug in for inviting young people to things like VBS and Sunday school, it's really important 
to grab these kids when they're young. I think it's about 94% of people come to Christ before their 18th birthday, so it's really important to invite those little ones. But that's where I accepted Christ and started my journey with Christ. And my mother didn't really understand those words, born again and saved. They weren't really part of her vocabulary. Um, she was a little nervous, but she did vet out the pastor and wife on, unbeknownst to me at that time, which was a great thing to do to make sure I hadn't been brainwashed. So. Um, for all those years, I witnessed to her um, as a teenager. Um, I would tell her, uh, you know, what I was learning in church, and she was um, a little bit resistant. She said she had her own beliefs, her own relationship with God. She said her own prayers. Um, and as I got married and started a career and had children, I would continue to witness to her, and sometimes the fervor would just get built up inside me, and I'd have to share. And she was disinterested and defensive and sometimes critical, and um, sometimes even really offended. Um, it's really hard when you think that your daughter is telling you you're not good enough, and um, none of us are good enough without Christ. So that's really the story that she heard, and it was um, a difficult pill for her to swallow. Um, she always had this affinity for collecting angels and Thomas Kincaid prints with verses about the light of the world. And, um, you know, I think those things played a part in her trying to reach out to God and have a feeling of God with her. And they always brought her comfort along with, you know, candlelight services and silent night. Um, and I believe that God was in there, you know, drawing her in at that time. Um, 32 years into my marriage, I found myself at the tail end of a divorce. Um, I didn't anticipate this in my life. I didn't want this to be my testimony, but it's where I was. And, you know, God redeems the damage of our lives. And Isaiah 61 beautifully illustrates this when he talks about uh, giving us um, beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness and that he will make us as trees of righteousness and plant us. And I realized that he planted me in this position as someone divorced with two aging parents. He allowed during COVID for um, us to buy a house together here in Greece. I came from Ontario County. And um, the house was a double house, so they were able to have their independence. My dad was about 95, my mother was 83. And uh, we were able to live together, and I was able to take care of them. Um, my dad was saved in 2021 with full-blown dementia. That's a story for another time, um, but it's a great one. But my mother witnessed that and wondered what was going on. She also survived COVID, and she had stage four cancer, COPD, and congestive heart failure, and she shouldn't have survived. And I wasn't the only one that told her that God spared her to save her. And she started to see these things, you know, these things happening in her life, the house lining up, the, the medical things, all of the, all the things just lining up in her life. She was pretty housebound um, at that time. I made sure her needs were met. Um, she just had to listen to the chatterings of my day. And like um, Pastor Kirk talked about in Matthew, that when we're that lampstand, that the light shines in our house. And when you have Jesus, you will, um, you know, that light will just shine out um, for you. So, did you open that for me? Thanks. My mouth gets really dry. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, this is the part where I had one yesterday, too. <laughs> so, interestingly, we moved from a very rural area to a neighborhood in Greece. And one night, the Lord just spoke to me, and he said, I'm speaking to your mother through my creation. And it was just kind of such a funny thing, but I started to notice that she was talking about the azaleas blooming in colors that she'd never seen in all her years. And the birds were having these, you know, full-on board relationships in the rafters that she was a part of. And even one day, she said that the tree in the neighbor's yard, she wished she could cut it down because it was dead. And the next day, she called me down and said that it had burst into full bloom that night, you know, before. And so God really was revealing himself. And she was really captivated by her creator and by creation at that time. Around that time, I, um, I saw the sign on the side of the church. I think it was around Easter for coming here. And I started coming to Saturday services. And it was really interesting because my mother felt that I had kind of come full circle, that here I was in a Lutheran church. And for her and for people that have come from denominations, you know how important that is. And she would ask me every time, did you go to the Lutheran church? What did you hear at the Lutheran church? So that was pretty exciting. So God uses everything. So um, 
At this point, my mother was getting sicker and sicker, and I was starting to really um, have a burden for her for knowing the Lord. And, you know, I can go to church and attend Bible study and do ministry, but if I'm not taking care of my own family and concerned about her eternity, I didn't, I didn't feel that that was right. So I had to kind of shift my thinking. And so the Lord really said, I want you on your knees. I want you praying every day for your mother, and I'm praying that you um, will ask me to open her eyes. Um, one of the things that would happen was every time we had a doctor's appointment, I would um, pray with her, and I might share something about God, and she would absolutely just avert her eyes from me. She wouldn't look at me. She wouldn't make eye contact. And so I knew that there was something in that when the Lord asked me to pray to open her eyes. So um, I started to get pretty desperate. Um, picturing your mother in a Christless eternity when you know Jesus is really just it sickens you. It's just a, a heartbreaking feeling to know that at this point, um, and you always hope for that, you know, deathbed experience. Well, sh she wouldn't have had it. She died in the middle of the night, so she wouldn't have had it. So there's, there's no time like the present. But um, a lot of doubt crept in that I was ineffective, that the things I was saying weren't making sense. They were insignificant. It was disjointed. I couldn't explain the gospel. And so then I decided I'd better call in the big guns. However, the Lord saved my mom before the big guns showed up for dinner, which was amazing. So, um, you know, I thought that, well, certainly a pastor is going to have the right words. He's going to say just exactly what my mother needs to hear, and he's anointed by this office. And, you know, God works with pastors, and he also works just with regular people. So the Lord had to show me that and build my faith up in that. So um, my mother was going to all these medical appointments. Uh, she was extremely anxious. She was usually a once a year to the doctor person, and now she was a dozen appointments uh, a month. And so she was very angry and anxious, and um, she wouldn't listen, and I think that's where that inattentiveness came from. She just couldn't even focus on anything but herself. So one day the doctor called and said he thought that she was not going to be able to have a procedure that he wanted her to have because she wasn't medically viable. And that kind of put the fight in her, and she wanted this procedure, and it kind of changed her thinking. So um, just as we did every night, I just kind of prayed with her, and I shared with her. I'd happened to heard a missionary speaking at another church from Poland and talk about disjointed. I mean, I just shared all of these facts about, um, you know, a Polish missionary. There wasn't any, you know, inherent gospel message in there. But at the end of the time that I talked, my mother said, I'm not sure what you just said to me, but it was the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. And that's when I knew that there was something going on. So I got a little nervous, and I said that we'd talk more tomorrow. <laughs> so the next day I asked her three questions. I said, who is Jesus to you? And she said, I think he's my savior, which was not the answer that I expected. And then I said, Mom, would you be willing to, is there any reason why you wouldn't um, want to ask Jesus into your life? And she said, no. And I said, would you be willing to pray with me? And she said, yes, right there in the car on the way to the procedure, which was rescheduled. And so we prayed right there in the car. And not only did she repeat after me as I made her do my entire teenage years um, as I was witnessing to her, but she poured out her heart to God. And at the end of that prayer, she clasped her hands and she looked up and she said three times, I'm going to heaven, I'm going to heaven, I'm going to heaven. And the Lord spoke to her spirit, letting her know that she was indeed his child. So, um, you know, it's not enough just to know that God exists and that angels are there and you have Bible verses in your house, but you have to enter willingly into a personal relationship with him. And so what I learned from this, even after 40 years of, of rejection of the gospel, that God does a mighty work, and you need to be firm in your own salvation. It doesn't mean you need to know all the answers or all the Bible verses or, or anything. You can use a disjointed conversation and God will use it. But you need to know that you yourself are saved. Um, you need to be willing to partner with God to do what he asks you to do. So praying every night was a new thing for me. Um, um, you have to care for the physical and sometimes financial needs of people before you can meet them spiritually. It wasn't until all of her needs were met that she was able to relax enough to really be receptive to the gospel. And you need to live your faith and be transparent. You know, people around you should know you love Jesus just by the way that you live, and they kind of catch on to it. I sort of treat everybody as if they're a believer, and they just have to kind of come along with what I'm talking about. And I think the main thing is that it's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. It's nothing I do or you do. It's, it's what God's done. 
And so Pastor Kirk just asked me to say how I feel about all of this. Well, the main thing is that when my mother did pass in August, of course I was sad, but almost immediately those tears turned to just thankfulness for God's mercy for saving her because I was never going to pray her into a physical life of eternity here on earth, no matter how much I prayed for her healing. But it was her soul that was saved, and that was amazing. I'm relieved that I'm going to see her again. I'm thankful that God... Um, had me be obedient to what he asked me to do. My faith has been built up. I'm more likely to share the gospel now. Um, you know, you get kind of a such a good feeling that you just want to do this again and again. So um, I just pray for all of you, for this church, um, that you all know Jesus and that you share your faith. Amen. <clears throat> I don't I don't know if you uh, noticed though, just the importance of prayer and how it took on a whole different level, praying and praying and praying and praying, because it's a spiritual warfare. The evil one does not want to give up any from his kingdom of darkness for them to come into the kingdom of light. And we need to be on our knees praying uh, for people. So again, let's thank Kirsten for coming up. Thank you so much. All right. So if God were to say to you, I want you to help someone get ready to leave this planet to meet me, who would that person be in your life? It's very, very hard to witness to family members, right? It's hard to witness to coworkers, neighbors. I think what Jesus would have said to Matthew, I think what he'd say to Kirsten, to all of you who are light, thank you for your courage. Thank you for your love for the loss. Matthew, you've only been following me a short time. You're a rookie follower, and yet here you are trying to reach your lost friends. You couldn't turn your back on your friends. You couldn't bear the fact that they might spend eternity separated from God. And so you threw this party, Matthew. I love your courage. And by the way, Matthew, the party's risky. It's absolutely risky because you know what? I know, Matthew, you had to deal with those religious folks, those Pharisees, who bashed you for doing this. And by the way, they don't care about the lost, Matthew, and I know that. But it's risky what you did, but eternity is at stake. Friends, that's why, why we exist. It's why we do all that we do. Whether it's worship here as a witness to others, to God, to every program ministry that happens in this place is ultimately so that we can get to know people and get to know us. We can share and introduce them to Jesus Christ. That's why we exist to point them to Jesus who said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. Jesus is the one who said, I'll be that thread of light that connects the creation of light with people walking in darkness. Jesus did it all for us. He said, I'll be the one who will glow, okay? And the glory of God will shine through me to the world. And it will culminate with my death on the cross. And I will give my life for the salvation of the world so people don't have to walk in darkness anymore. And as I said, they tried to snuff out the light and to bury the light, but they could not do it because he burst forth in resurrection life. And that resurrection, Jesus' resurrection, is what brought light into the darkness to bring hope to the hopeless and life to the empty. And just in closing, it's, it's really neat. After the resurrection, you know, we know that Jesus appeared to over 500 people. Everybody knew where the empty tomb was. This was right outside of Jerusalem. Hundreds of people came. We know from the early church fathers that many, many more came because the first followers of Jesus, they actually worshipped at the empty tomb. And they lit a candle and they put it in that tomb so that everybody would know where that empty tomb was. But eventually... They snuffed out that candle. Why? Because they understood it's not about being a candle and about a place of the tomb. It is about us being light to the world and bringing the powerful gospel for people to hear. You are the light of the world. You know, the thing about a light bulb, when you think about it, it has absolutely no power in and of itself, right? Incredibly fragile. By the way, these are plastic, so when you write names of people on it, you don't have to worry about breaking it, okay? In fact, the filament on the inside is probably the most fragile part. Thomas Edison tried over 3,000 different methods of creating the light bulb, and finally he came up with something after using all kinds of different plant-based things for the filament. The, uh, he patented the carbon filament. 
He needed to find something that could receive an electrical charge that would not melt, that would not break down. And this little filament can't do anything on its own. But when you plug it into the power source, it shines. And Jesus Christ is our power source. And notice a light bulb doesn't have to strain, doesn't have to stress, doesn't have to worry, just needs to stay connected to the power source. There is a thread on every bulb to be screwed in so that it can, be, so it can light up wherever there is darkness. And Jesus is asking, will you be the thread to illuminate your workplace, your home, your classroom, your gym, your neighborhood with my light? Because when the sun goes down and the darkness falls, people will see in their darkness you shining. They will see in the darkness of their brokenness, in the darkness of their pain, in the darkness of their suffering, they will see your light and you will point them to the light of the world. And beloved of God, the time is running short. And there are people I know you care about and you love who are not yet ready to leave this planet to meet God. So will you pray more fervently? Will you love more intentionally? Will you invite them to worship? Will you share the hope that you have within you? So here's my ask. After the service, would you just take a few minutes and would you go grab a light bulb and there's markers out there and just write the names of people on the light bulb and then take it over to the light board. And again, those of you online, just type in the names. We'll do it for you. Brockport Campus, you do it out in the lobby. And then just screw the light bulb into the, into the light board. And we'll see that word, hope, illuminate. And then we're going to pray for these people throughout the year that they would come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior, that God, by his grace, would take more people out of the kingdom of darkness into the marvelous kingdom of his light so that heaven will be more crowded. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me? Oh, Lord God, we thank you for our Savior who is the light of the world, who won salvation for the world. How amazing it is that he would use broken, weak, um, fragile filaments like us. So, Lord, help us to stay connected to you. Jesus, help us to abide with you, to walk with you. And when the darkness comes into our friends and neighbors and coworkers' lives, as it will sooner or later, would you let our light shine? That we have the hope of the gospel. And, oh, Lord, would you use us for your eternal purposes. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you rise and worship with us?
is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I've surrendered now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Sing it again, your goodness. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. with you. Amen.